So in today's video, we're going to be looking at uh, muscular dystrophy, specifically Duchenne and Becker. So there's four criteria that is required for uh, diagnosing a uh, dystrophy. Uh, the, f the first one is going to be, it has to be a primary myopathy. Uh, secondly, it has to be uh, some type of genetic basis, so it can't be infectious or any other basis. Uh, third, it has to be progressive, so it can't uh, you know, stay still. And finally, there has to be some degeneration or death of the muscle. So these are the four criteria required to generally tell you that you have a dystrophy. And then there's going to be, uh, depending on which dystrophy you have, there's going to be some things that are more specific. So uh, next we'll move on to is going to be pathophysiology. Um, so first of all, uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy is the most common uh, hereditary neuromuscular disease out there. So um, it kind of has that uh, role to play. Not Becker as much. Becker is going to be a little bit uh, less prominent. It is X-linked recessive. It's um, linked to the uh, XP21 gene, uh, which codes for the dystrophin gene. And so uh, what does the dystrophin gene do? It, first of all, it is one of the largest genes in the uh, in the entire DNA and this kind of this is why gene therapy is a little bit difficult uh, what it does is it connects the connective tissue to the muscle uh, so in other words it, it transfers the energy from the muscle to the connective tissue so it's very very important in uh, your muscle movement um, even though it's extinct recessive 30 percent are actually new mutations so uh, very common to get new mutations asymptomatic mothers Girls do get this. Um, it is a milder form, and this is uh, kind of follows the Lyon hypothesis, uh, which says that you know since women have the bar bodies, they tend to only 50% of their cells will have the troubled cells, and the other 50% will be okay. So it tends to be slightly mi uh, milder. Um, there, and because of the bar body theory, it tends to be high in patients with Turner syndrome, which is one uh, XO. Uh, and also, there are asymptomatic female carriers. Uh, and the only symptom or finding that you'll have is an increase in creatine kinase in about 80% of them. So now this pathophysiology is the same for uh, whether you're talking about Duchenne or whether you're talking about Becker. Uh, the only thing is in Becker, it's going to be much, much milder. Okay, so um, after talking about pathophysiology, let's go over to the clinical aspects. Um, in the first year, um, everything will be pretty much normal. So they will have their normal or maybe slightly delayed milestones, but it's very slight, nothing to be kind of too much uh, worried about. Um, you will have normal walking at about 12 months. Um, however, there may be some uh, hip girdle weakness. So even though they're normally walking, they might, you might have some slight hip girdle weakness that might give you some point. Um, one of the first signs, however, is that they have poor head control early on. Uh, but again, that's, very very slight sign not diagnostic by any means uh, then as they become toddlers uh, they, t they tend to walk okay they tend to be slightly lordotic and this is because uh, they're trying to compensate for uh, gluteal weakness because one of the first muscles affected is, is, is within the hip area specifically uh, the gluteus um, now in three to five years this is when you start actually noticing the gower sign and so this is a very very um, prominent sign and, and it and it is, uh, makes the disease very apparent uh, that this patient is suffering from something. So generally what happens is that when they, when they try to get up, they uh, move their hands onto their knees, and then they try to walk up as they're moving. So, um, and then this will and so when they're trying to walk up as they're moving, uh, the reason they're doing this is because the area of the hip and the gluteus is uh, weak, and so they have to use their distal muscles to get up. Um, now, in the, by the time they become seven to eight years old, they become wheelchair bound, and um, they can extend this to twelve years old uh, if they if they get treatment early on. Um, and so, uh, and the treatment that they generally receive is going to be more like physiotherapy and strengthening the muscles. Now, um, by the time they're twenties, uh, you have a lot going, um, a lot more going on. Um, Uh, since the distal muscles are preserved, uh, they are able to do things such as eat, write, and use a keyboard. However, after a while, um, they, de they, de they tend to develop respiratory symptoms, and this is characterized by a weak cough, uh, increased in, uh, infections, and having a decreased respiratory reserve. Um, finally, you can also get uh, pharyngeal uh, aspects in, in their 20s, where the, and in this they'll have 
uh, increased aspiration, uh, there'll be liquid regurgitation, and they'll tend to have, uh, and their voice quality will be much more nasal. Um, beyond this, uh, there are some other complications uh, that, that can occur. Uh, firstly, they can get contractures, uh, and these contractures will occur in the ankles, uh, knees, uh, you can also get them in the hips and the elbows. Besides this, um, it is associated with scoliosis, and this scoliosis occurs early on, but once they become ambulatory, it increases with uh, ambulation, so once they get in that uh, wheelchair. Uh, next, the most characteristic feature is going to be pseudo-hypertrophy, and this is when you have uh, enlargements of the calf muscle. So the calf muscle becomes uh, much enlarged, but this isn't due to, uh, you know, because it's stronger. Uh, what it's due to is hypertrophy of the actual fibers. And then what happens is once it hypertrophies, you have fat infiltration, and then you have uh, collagen deposition uh, immediately afterwards. Uh, there also is some thigh atrophy, and that's just because of uh, disuse atrophy. And of course, uh, pseudo hypertrophy, hypertrophy can also uh, occur in the tongue as well as the calf. Uh, next is going to be the cardiomyopathy that does occur, so it's a smooth muscle. Uh, what tends to happen is they become tachycardic and they eventually go into congestive heart failure. Um, interestingly, it's not usually correlated with the skeletal muscle, so they might have a severe skeletal muscle uh, disease but very minor heart disease, or they might not have much skeletal muscle disease but have very severe uh, heart disease. So they're ne not generally correlated with each other. Uh, next effect is going to be on the intellect. Uh, these patients are associated with a very low IQ, sometimes less than 70 and about 20 to 30 percent. However, sometimes it's much more subtle and they just need some type of remedial help in school. Overall, they're okay. Um, and finally, there is a slight increase in epilepsy. And this, uh, this all is because uh, dystrophin has been found in the brain. So they feel like uh, this is the reason why uh, they tend to have all these intellectual problems. And finally, uh, and quite sadly, uh, death uh, usually occurs due to respiratory failure in sleep. Um, in Duchesne's, it's going to be mid-20s. Uh, mid-20s is Duchesne's. And um, in Becker's, it's going to be the late 20s. So Becker's, again, it's a little bit more milder, so it tends to be uh, a little late. And, that's, and between Duchesne and Becker's, that's the highlighting feature. Uh, Becker tends to be a little bit uh, less severe, uh, slower onset, uh, and Duchesne tends to be more severe, quicker onset, and death occurs uh, a few years earlier. So um, what type of uh, investigations would you want to run? Uh, the first investigation that you generally want to do is the uh, creatine kinase. Uh, this is uh, high early on as they have muscle, but as they begin to lose muscle, uh, then it becomes decreased in the late stages. Uh, you also want to do an echo, uh, ECG, and an x-ray uh, of the heart to look at the heart changes as what's going on. Uh, you can also do electromyography. Uh, this will usually show everything normal because there's no denervation and the mild, uh, the motor and sensory uh, neuroconduction is uh, going to be normal. Uh, so how do you diagnose it, uh, definitive diagnosis? Uh, one is can be, uh, you can do PCR of the dystrophin gene. So this is a uh, pretty classical way of diagnosing it. Um, however, if you get a, a negative, uh, you might want to also do a muscle biopsy. And this is because this can catch up to the one third of the false negatives. So this is very important to do that. Uh, the test that you do is called dystrophin immunocytochemistry, so that's the test for it. And generally the biopsy that you would take is either going to be from the quadriceps or the gastrocnemius, which is the calf muscle. Treatment. Uh, we, can, we can talk about treatment now. Um, so the treatment, there you go, treatment is, um, there is no cure um, and there's no way to really slow it down, uh, which is, you know, sad fact. Um, but you do try to de limit the complications and you try to increase the quality of life. Um, so the first thing that you want to do is, you know, you want to protect the heart. Uh, the heart, you can use the jocks and that tends to work pretty well. Uh, next, pulmonary infections. Um, first of all, there's a few ways you want to tackle this. The first thing you want to do is you want to avoid uh, people who are sick. Uh, you want to keep these patients uh, vaccinated. And if they do get an infection, uh, you want to make sure that you treat Promptly. You treat it right away and treat it very aggressively before it gets severe. Um, next thing that they can also do is they can do physiotherapy. Um, physiotherapy is oftentimes done for the contractures, but uh, sometimes the contractures can be beneficial. Uh, and this is because uh, oftentimes, like with, the, with, with regards to the elbow, uh, if it wasn't contracted, it would just flail around everywhere. 
So the contractor will keep it in 90 degrees, it'll kind of keep it up, and then they can actually use their distal uh, muscles. So you, you might actually want to leave the contractors where they are. Uh, next, uh, exercise. Um, you don't want to do, you want to do exercise, but not too rigorous, rigorously, otherwise uh, the, the muscles can't handle it and you get increased degeneration. Um, finally, glucocorticoids. Um, they have been shown to decrease the rate of apoptosis and um, increase strength, uh, at least initially. It, didn't, it does tend to stop working after a while. And the problem with this is uh, there does tend, tend to be apoptosis and weight gain uh, that generally occurs with chronic use. And so you get these, uh, I guess, Cushingoid uh, symptoms that you need to watch out for. So uh, this is uh, the muscular dystrophies. Hope you enjoyed. See you in the next video. Thanks.